Good afternoon, I'm Cindy Hall, president of the Women's Congressional Policy Institute, or WCPI, as many of you know. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing, The STEM Gap, Building the Pathways for Women of Color in STEM Careers. We are pleased to have all of you here with us today and welcome those who are joining us virtually through the live, live stream. As most of you know, WCPI is a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy organization. Our mission is to bring together a community of bipartisan women policymakers and trusted partners to advance issues of importance to women, develop the next generation of women leaders, and foster a more effective and representative democracy. We work closely with the members and staff of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. In our discussion today, we will be hearing from three inspiring women who will share their experiences on how they have built their careers in the fields of wireless technology, construction, and astrophysics. Our special thanks to Qualcomm for their support for this briefing. We appreciate their commitment to promoting gender equity in technology and increasing the number of women of color in STEM fields. I would like to thank our Congressional Briefing co-sponsors, the leadership of the Women's Caucus, Congresswomen Madeline Dean and Jennifer gonzalez Cologne, co-chairs, and Congresswomen Lucy McBath and Kat Kamak, vice chairs. Our special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Lola Awumiyi Oteri, Cordelia Evans, and Dr. Hashima Hassan, each of whom will be introduced shortly. We will be live tweeting during the briefing. We encourage you and others to do so as well at WCPI STEM. I am now pleased to turn the podium over to our moderator, Cynthia Ramos. And we are expecting several members of Congress. So uh, our plan at this moment is to go ahead with presentations. No one will be interrupted in the middle of it. Um, but we may be fitting members in, in between speakers. And so Cynthia Ramos, our policy director. Thank you, Cindy. As many of you may know, women are still overwhelmingly underrepresented in STEM fields. And according to the latest data, only 11.6% of science and engineering employees in the U.S. are women of color. Today, we have invited three women who have forged their own path and have been excelling in the fields of wireless technology, construction, and space technology. It's my pleasure to welcome our first panelist, Dr. Lola Awumiyi Oteri. Dr. Awumiyi Oteri is a principal systems engineer in research and development at Qualcomm Technologies. She knows all about the breakthroughs in wireless communications. She invented many of them. Lola's inventions help reduce power consumption while enhancing network mobility and the mobile user experience for 3G, 4G, and 5G connectivity. She's responsible for more than 300 worldwide patents and applications in the wireless communications field. Growing up in Nigeria, Lola developed a love for technology that she carried with her to the US. Lola. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of today's conversation. Uh, thank you to our representatives, and we appreciate your leadership in championing uh, women's issues. Uh, today, I will be talking to you about my pathway to a career in uh, STEM, um, to, and also to becoming an inventor, and also some thoughts that I have on how we can create a pathway for others, especially young women and women of color. My passion in telecommunications or communications in general started um, as a little girl, a six-year-old. And I had the opportunity to watch my dad, who was an electrical engineer, uh, work on a project um, that was meant to actually uh, broadcast the National Independence Day celebration in Nigeria at his capital for the entire country so that people could watch the celebration at once. As a six-year-old, seeing the excitement on people's faces that day and how they watched everything together and everybody cheered, I was hooked. I saw the power of technology to impact a significant number of people. To me, that was how I got into STEM. I wanted to learn about physics and math and how it works and how technology works and how we can impact people. Shortly after that, 
I started to study math and physics, and I went on to actually get a bachelor's in electrical engineering, a master's, and a PhD. And after that, I wanted to get out into the industry and get my hands dirty, get some hands on experience. And I, I was hired by Qualcomm. In 2008, I joined Qualcomm. And Qualcomm has always been at the forefront of our wireless technology, really um, defining some of the groundbreaking technologies um, wireless settlement technologies that we know, 3G, 4G, 5G, and we're even starting to imagine the future of 6G. Uh, Qualcomm is really responsible for some of these fundamental technologies that we have to communicate. So we have things in our, uh, technology in our smartphones. We have GPS, we have the camera, we have streaming videos, name it. Uh, today, Qualcomm holds over 140,000 worldwide patents and patent applications for its mobile technology and I'm in related fields. And as she said, I have actually been fortunate to contribute to over 300 of those. So when I joined Qualcomm, I joined Qualcomm to work on 3G, and then I went on to 4G, and then 5G. And 5G is like um, the um, technology because it's now revolutionizing a lot of industries. So we're not only talking, but we're helping healthcare, we're, we're into smart factories, uh, smart cities, uh, 5G is in, in all our lives, as we can imagine. I, was, um, I am working on the, the performance aspect of 5G, but also the aspect of power savings. So how do we ensure that we actually have adequate battery power when we use our communication device that can transmit lots of data at the same time? A lot of the times when I work on these ideas, I'm working with people in groups who have been brainstorming. Sometimes I work on it them personally. And you end up with this long laundry list of what could be proposals. Um, you refine those over time. You, you uh, perform computer simulations to actually refine your assumptions and see if uh, the performance you expected is actually going to be what you see uh, after simulating them. And at times, you actually build prototypes. At the end of the day, if you do end up with any surviving proposals, um, that's great. If you don't, you go back to the process. Um, it's interesting, I love this process, but the interesting thing about it is uh, sometimes I am the only woman in the room, and many a times the only woman of color. But that, for me, um, can be lonely, and I know that's why we get up here today. I'm happy to be having this conversation. Now, to, to help address this, I have some thoughts on this, and I really think um, we have to really look at how we recruit and have more strategic um, recruiting process, and also look into how we build inclusive environments for the people we bring into our co uh, companies and organizations. So in terms of recruiting, I believe in, a, in the saying that says, uh, birds of the same feather flock together. And I think when we do go to recruit on campuses or wherever we recruit our STEM uh, women, of, uh, women of color or even women in general, we have to send a diverse recruiting team that reflects the diversity that we, got, we have in our organization for the diversity that we hope to see. Uh, for example, I went to a women's lunch like this at one of the conferences and I came across a woman of color, very smart, intelligent, she was graduating, and she hadn't even thought about a flight to Qualcomm. I shared my story about my journey at Qualcomm and she was like, here's my resume. <laughs> so I took it back and we interviewed her and she works at Qualcomm today. That for me was actually heartwarming to see that, you know what, there are women out there, we just have to know how to get them in. The next thing is once we get them in, you ask how do we retain them? So we really do have to build this inclusive environment where people feel like they belong, they can be their best, they're comfortable, and start to just contribute in ways that they can. And some of the ways that we've done that at Qualcomm is really really by training management, because I think it starts with them. When management understands the value of inclusion and diversity, and can push that message down all the way from a CEO to the intern, that everybody understands that there is value in having diverse uh, people from a diverse background, it does make a difference. And also supporting employee-led um, networks within our co companies and organization, I am. I am proud to be a member of our women's network at Qualcomm, our black network at Qualcomm, and also the opportunity to move from division to division, building my own network of colleagues that are supporting me as I walk through Qualcomm has made a difference in my life. 
So you say we bring them into the company, we are doing this inclusive environment, we are thriving, what next? How do we transition people from having thriving, not only having thriving careers in STEM, to actually being inventors? So that's a question to ask, and how do we do that? I think initially most people that come to the center probably are not exposed to, to the inventing process. So training them, showing them how to do them, how to create an ethical process, uh, matching them with mentors. Those are ways that we can do it to encourage people to actually go through this process without being intimidated of, of how it is. Because a lot of people here that are practicing in that can be intimidated. But can you have a mentor walk you through that process? Those are ways I think that we um, can really achieve some success in this area. And also at Qualcomm, Qualcomm is not only passionate about uh, the, uh, diversity, but it's also taking this outside the company to partner with, with um, Invent Together organization, where we're launching this, um, the Inventor Patent Academy, a free online course where people can actually see inventors of diverse backgrounds and also they provide us a practical knowledge on how to navigate the patenting process. Those are some of the resources that we can make available to people to actually invent. So in bringing this to a close, I would just like to say that if we want to see this continuous progress in, in really closing this STEM gap uh, within our underrepresented group, uh, we really have to do this holistically. And holistically, two points I would like to stress. One is really by ensuring that our, our, our children, the younger ones, are exposed to STEM education at an early age and continuously. I had the luxury of a father in the age of continue who exposed me to, to STEM continuously, and that has brought me to this point. We need to do that, especially for our underrepresented groups, women, women of color, um, our people with disability, and also our veterans. And also, as a, as a wife and a mother, I have two kids, and I have those kids back while trying to invent. Um, if I did not have access to the paid medical and therapy, I would not have the luxury of knowing I can spend time with my kids, that I, my job will be there when I come back, and that it would not impact me negatively. In fact, after the first, my first kid, I came back, and during that review uh, period, I got promoted. That was the benefit. So in general, I would just say overall, having this inclusive, innovative um, ecosystem will not only give us diversity of perspectives, but it will give us a broad range of ideas. And these ideas will really strengthen the solutions that we bring to solving a lot of the challenging problems that we have today. Therefore, the equal opportunity to invent, to patent, and to commercialize these innovative ideas will really strengthen our, our innovative economy. It would lead to the production and to, to the creation of products and services that are addressing problems, big problems that we have in our world today. It will strengthen, it will stimulate also our economic growth, and overall, it would impact millions of people. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to further discussion on this. Thank you for inviting me. We really appreciate you about your amazing work in wireless technologies and everything that Qualcomm is doing to support women, women of color in this field. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce Congressman Madeline Dean, Democratic Co-Chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. Congresswoman Dean is serving her second term representing the 4th District of Pennsylvania, and she serves on the Financial Services and Judiciary Committees. Among her many priorities in Congress, she's a strong advocate for women and girls' education, including women in STEM. Congressman Dean. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is fun to be here with you on this crazy week. Uh, and thank you for that inspirational talk and path uh, and journey that you have been on and how you're helping others. I loved your notions of really dreaming uh, and inventing. Uh, I'm a mom. I have three sons uh, and three daughters-in-law, and I have four grandchildren. And three of my grandchildren are girls. I want them dreaming and inventing and having a path to their future. So good afternoon. I'm Madeline Dean, Congresswoman for Pennsylvania's 4th Congressional District. Hello. You're here. Oh, I want to ask about you. 
Um, it's my privilege to serve uh, as co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. So, Cindy, always thank you for the work that you do and for bringing us all together. Thank you to the Women's Congressional Policy Institute for hosting this important conversation. A briefing on recruiting and retaining women of color in STEM. Uh, and Qualcomm Technologies, thank you for supporting and uh, sponsoring the discussion. I am delighted to be here with my co-chair, uh, Representative Jennifer Gonzalez Colon. I've been thinking about you a lot and the people of Puerto Rico. And I was thinking about power as you were talking, Dr. Lola, uh, and how it is that we will solve these problems. And it'll be women and women of color and girls uh, who will bring us quicker solutions to these devastating uh, storms uh, and the, the, the suffering of the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, you are all in our hearts. Uh, also, I think maybe joining us eventually are our vice chairs, Representative Lucy McBath uh, and Representative Kat Kamak. Uh, we also will later be joined by Chrissy Houlihan, Representative Houlihan and Re Representative Haley Stevens. Uh, we have worked closely on the Bipartisan Women's Caucus uh, and the, the Congressional Policy Institute to tackle issues affecting women and girls, to lift up expert voices. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here with you, Dr. Lola, to learn from you, uh, Cordelia Evans from IBEW. Uh, not sure, where's, there you go. Hello, Cordelia, great to see you. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Hassan of NASA, great to be with you also. Uh, thank you for sharing your own experiences in STEM. Uh, for offering insights into the barriers that women of color face in STEM professions. You see, I'm a former professor. I taught for 10 years at LaSalle University, never in the STEM field, always over in the English department. Uh, but I saw how powerful it was for students to claim their education, particularly uh, minority students, particularly women, and to find out what path was going to be best for them and their aspirations. And most importantly, to expose them before college two different pathways so that they have some sense of opportunities that maybe they didn't know were out there. We have to do more. It is our obligation, I believe, to do more for women of color when they are studying these subjects, uh, when they are in their education, elementary education, high school education, and then college and careers. In my own district, we have an exciting program that was just launched at our local community college, Montgomery County Community College, uh, just opened our Challenger Center. It is the first Challenger Center in Pennsylvania. It's a Challenger Learning Center born out of the Challenger tragedy. The families of uh, the Challenger tragedy have put together an institute and they are embedding them in different schools. They embedded one in our community college. It's not just for community college students. It's actually aimed at fifth and sixth graders to expose children at a young age to STEM, uh, to becoming a possibility of an astronaut and all of the careers that support uh, our exploration of, of um, so, uh, um, uh, science and, and space. Uh, what you were saying, Dr. Lowley, the idea of exposing children to STEM, I'm so excited because it also happens to be in the town of Pottstown, which is a town that really struggles. It struggles economically, it struggles with our education system. We don't have enough dollars and resources and fighting for more for the students of Pottstown. So this is a really cool addition. It's beautiful space. It's exciting to think about children there at control rooms uh, and perhaps seeing themselves in any one of these careers in STEM. I wanna close by saying I'm heading from here uh, and I'm sorry I'll be leaving you so quickly, but I'm heading from here over to serve on a hearing in financial services. I have the honor of serving on uh, the subcommittee chaired by Joyce Beatty on diversity and inclusion. So trust me when I say that the information that you're sharing here is something we are thinking about there, and there's power in that. If we had gone back maybe 10 years, I don't know that we would have been having these same honest conversations about how do we make sure we make our workforce as diverse as possible, our education as diverse as possible, our workforce, because we know that adds value to any one of our industries. So I'm super grateful for discussions like this, inspiring to hear uh, from the folks who are right up here uh, and look forward to future conversations. Cindy, always thank you for including me. Thanks. Congresswoman Dean for your remarks. Um, we certainly appreciate your commitment to building opportunities for women and girls of color to pursue careers in STEM. 
Uh, and now I am pleased to introduce our next congressman, Congressman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, Republican co chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. Congressman Gonzalez Colon was elected to represent Puerto Rico in 2016 and serves on the Natural Resources and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees. Her priorities include promoting STEM education in Puerto Rico for women and girls and supporting funding for STEM related programs. Congressman Gonzalez Colon. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here, although back home is a completely different story. Uh, more than 70% of the island of Puerto Rico that I represent here in Congress is without power. And this is not the first time, right? Uh, five years ago, we were hit by Hurricane Irma and Maria uh, that got us a complete blackout for uh, many communities for even nine months. Uh, so it's, you know, devastation all over again, mental health happening, and people remembering what happened with the hurricane. So, as we deal with that, uh, uh, I want to say thank you for uh, seeing me at, at the Congressional uh, um, uh, Policy Institute for doing this. I think it's important. We, we cannot we cannot leave you know the industry uh, to maintain the current curse in terms of you know how many women are going to be in the STEM field. Um, and of course, Congress got a lot of power to push for many of the agendas that would allow. Uh, women, women, minorities, and women of color to, to do it. But I think, uh, you know, this kind of briefing is, is so refreshing when you can see the experience and people who actually are in the field talking about their experiences. Uh, so in that sense, I want to say thank you uh, for being here uh, with us today. And one of the most notable setbacks uh, is the lack of equal participation uh, of women in, in STEM. And, and when I say women, I say in all fields. Uh, not just women of colors. In, in, in my case, I'm Hispanic, same thing as well. Um, I am happy to join uh, you today, and thank you, Cindy, for always giving us that, that help and organizing this to be in a bipartisan way. I think bipartisanship is the only way that you can actually achieve things and, and, and remain uh, for, for most of, our, of us. And I, I understand that despite notable increases in participation, uh, employment, and retention of women in certain academic and professional careers uh, that have traditionally been dominated by their male counterparts, participation of women in STEM continue to be, you know, to fall behind. And if we add to that, women of color challenge and disparity can can even be greater than that. Um, according, I, I always try to just. I'm not the expert here, you are. Uh, but I think that uh, according to results of many uh, early childhood uh, studies, students from different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds uh, begin school with different levels of preparation uh, in math, science, uh, which tend to continue as, as they reach higher grades. Uh, and this illustrates how disparities in these areas can be perceived from an early age but we are not tackling them on time. And, and that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, some figures indicate that women continue their studies, leading them to earning uh, most of the advanced degrees, but only a small group graduate with degrees in highly specialized STEM fields like engineering, computer science. And additionally, uh, while in school, many women do not see equal participation between male and female professors, uh, nor equal racial representation, those issues impact the workforce as we continue to notice gender and racial disparities between these groups in STEM. And that's the reason I think, you know, maintaining the issue with briefings like this and, 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 and calling what's happening and what Congress can do specifically uh, to, to manage those issues is, is the way to do, is the way to, to achieve something. Um, I think that in general, this means that there's less of an incentive for young women and girls to pursue STEM careers, uh, less financial opportunities for women considering most STEM fields are general, generally, generally uh, compens compensated, and ultimately uh, less resources and human capital for our nation uh, to rely on maintaining its leadership on science and related fields. Uh, and in other words, uh, all stand to lose on more ways than one because of the existing STEM gap. Um, and, and in that sense, I think we, we've got a lot to do. Uh, I have co-sponsored legislation that 
has supported minorities and women in STEM and look forward to learn how else we can we can help. You know, and and you got you're in the field. You know what's going on. Tell us specifically what actions can Congress to take uh, in order to fix that. Um, because coming from that direct experience will help us achieve results. So I look forward uh, for my, my staff is going to be here. I, I need to leave as well, like, like Marily. Marily has been a, a great co-chair to work with uh, in a bipartisan way. Uh, this is a crazy week here in Congress, and uh, as you may, may know before the midterms, uh, but I want to say thank you again, and uh, in any other experience or um, ideas, feel free uh, to let us know. We're more than happy to not just co-sponsor, champion uh, those ideas. If we don't do it ourselves, nobody's going to do it for us. Uh, so thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Gonzalez Cohn, for everything that you do to support women and girls of color in STEM. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Cordelia Evans. Cordelia Evans is a business representative for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW Local 26. She represents more than 10,000 electricians in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and including electricians located in the Pentagon. She currently is the only woman representing the local Union 26 office, and she negotiates various collective bargaining agreements for maintenance and Pentagon electricians, and she's worked in the construction field for more than 23 years, where she's performed hands-on tasks on numerous commercial and residential construction job sites. Cordelia? Everyone has a story. My stories consist of, um, as she stated, um, I go from the beginning. I started out in high school, um, fifth or sixth grade, sixth grade, enjoying math and science. That's how I got into engineering. Um, attending school in New York City, I eventually applied to the um, University of Buffalo, and I was studying English for engineering. However, what I didn't do is enough research as far as how cold it was in um, Buffalo, New York. <laughs> It's freezing cold, negative 17 degrees. No, I'm not built for negative 17 degrees. <laughs> so after three years of attending um, University of Buffalo, I relocated. I think I, um, my roommate and I um, came to uh, Maryland DMV area um, during spring break. And during spring break, I, I felt alive. I enjoyed the, the, the weather, which was, um, it was close to summertime, but it was nice and warm. And I loved the difference as far as the different color that was here compared in Buffalo, you know, we're, we're like a small um, number as far as minority in, in Buffalo, New York. And I feel isolated in the classroom and, you know, maneuvering myself in Buffalo. So being here, I felt alive. And even though I had like two more years to graduate, and I was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm tired of the cold. Um, so I relo relocated to DMV. I had no structure as far as we were planning to follow to attend school. Actually, at first, I, I thought about attending University of Maryland, but then, you know, upon doing so, um, in New York, we had Pell Grant, Pell and Tap, um, I'm, I think they still have it, but Pell and Tap, but took me to um, Buffalo, but then I had to learn about student loan. I never bought a student loan, I had to buy a student loan in um, Buffalo. So upon relocating to Maryland, I still had student loan, over $30,000 in student loan at the time. And I'm like, I, 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 um, there's one thing I don't want to do is, um, for a student loan because I don't want to come out of college out of college in debt. So what I did was um, at the time my best friend husband was an electrician. I was working in an office and um, I saw him and um, I was like, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I'm an electrician. So I put the two together. Okay, electrician, I'm studying engineering. Maybe I can start this field and then eventually pay for myself to go back to college. And then once I um, applied for electrical field, um, I enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy it. I, I, I was most most job site. I was the only female on the job site. Sometimes you may be a 100, 200 guys in the job site. I'm short. I wear heels to make myself tall. However, in the job force, I'm a 5'4", and guys are like 6'5 and above, and you have to deal with them aggressive alpha males, you know? And then in, in doing so, I have to bring my alpha female with me. Um, I never felt intimidated working around men to the simple fact that being an engineer and an SB, I was always surrounded by men. So for me being with men, then I have to bring my alpha, alpha female side 
to actually maneuver myself in whatever job job we were doing. So um, upon um, getting into the union, I eventually applied and learned about a trade school. Actually, it's a five-year school, um, IBW Local 26. Um, so I applied for the trade school and I got accepted. I think the first time I did not get accepted because at the time I did not know that tired to wear when um, um, conducting myself as far as going for an interview. So I thought an interview, I had my suit on, I had my heels, I had my resume and everything. And I stepped in, remind you, I'm in a panel with six men, older white men. And I was a black female trying to apply for the apprenticeship. And I think they looked at me and was like, what is she trying to do? Because in order for you to go into the construction field, you have to have, it's a special type of unique female that would actually attend the construction field. And I remember going for my interview, I was nervous at the time because I'm walking in the mail and I have my heels in and I'm saying to myself, they're not gonna accept me. Cause they're like, she's not gonna make it. And I had my nails done and everything, prepared for the interview. And um, so my first year I did not get accepted, but I was persistent. And I applied the second year and I foresee myself getting accepted into the trade. And I, um, upon applying there, I got accepted into the trade. Eventually, I completed five years of study of the, um, the trade. Um, I've been in the trade for over 23 years, in the office for three years. In doing so, the beautiful thing about being in the union, once you're in the union, we call, it's, it's called a yellow ticket, because your dues receipt, right? You pay every quarter or, or once a year. In doing so, you can go to any state that you prefer. If you prefer, if the work is um, slow in your state, you can go to any state and you can work out of that state based on whatever wage. You don't have to negotiate a wage because it's already negotiated through for you through the CBA that we have. So in doing so, I remember in 2013, um, we had um, work wasn't as prevalent as it is now in Local 26. Um, so we were slow as far as employees, you know, requesting for employees to work there. And I was able to travel to different states. Um, in local 26, in my local, I think once I was able to become a foreman. Um, you have a desire to be in management position, and sometimes it's hard to accept the fact that you are being overlooked as a female, and they will gravitate towards a guy, even though you might have more experience than another guy. There was times where I do have experience as my helper, and instead of having a conversation with myself, they would go to my helper, and I, a lot of times I would purposely step to the side and I allowed him to talk to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then eventually they would have to come to me and I'm like, okay, what do you want? You know? So in doing so, it, 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 was a, it was a challenge at first, but eventually once I maneuver myself and learn the skills and whatnot and being able to travel, I was able to travel from Nebraska all the way to California. And in doing so, I got a chance to be not only a foreman, but I was able to be a general foreman. The general foreman that's, that's the one that oversees. Not a superintendent, the general foreman Oversees the the form, so I was in charge of at the time it was like twelve form. Each form had twenty guys in it. It felt good. That energized me, and I'm happy I was. Um, I got a chance to travel because in doing so, I checked in me and contact my business business manager, um, and and I would inform him like, hey, I'm in this state, I'm in this state, I need a travel letter, and I would receive that so he knew every every state that I was traveling to, and in regards to work. So upon returning to the DMV area um, in 2018, um, he came to me and there was an opening uh, for a business rep. And he knew that I was well-rounded, got a chance to travel to a different state. And he said, hey, do you wanna, um, do you wanna return you know, into the office? Um, I saw myself work, working in the office, but with a contractor. You know, I got passed over, you know, becoming a, um, maybe an um, estimator for a contractor and whatnot. And I wait my turn because I said, what God has for me, no one can shut the door on me. So that's always my say. But I wait my turn, and once he approached me for that position, I spoke to my husband, and he told me to go for it. And then I accepted his um, the, um, the position as far as being a rep. The beautiful thing about being a rep now with IBW, even though I'm not I'm the only female, I'm not intimidated by men. I'm usually, yes, the only female with men, but I use their energy to propel to do whatever needs to be done. I'm currently the vice president for Sisters of 26. We just recently attended a women's conference and that I received, it was overwhelming, the information that I received. Uh, recently, we just had our our, um, our meeting. It's, I think we had like, got charted in 2018 into IBW. 
um, based on the demand from our Vice President Ron Stevenson. So we just got charted into the 26th, and in doing so, we attended the conference. There were seven women that attended the conference. We gained information how we can actually bring more women into the trade. Not only that, but how we can retain the women there. Um, currently, I'm working with, um, there's a football team called DC Divas, and I'm currently working with them. Um, I brought so far, I think it's like three women. It's a small scale. However, we're starting because I remember when I graduated five years ago, I was the only female in the class. And I purposely, that's the time, but I purposely um, wore a pink, a pink outfit so you could recognize me. I purposely sat in the middle of the classroom so you could recognize, oh, that's the female that graduated in 2000 whatever. So that was beautiful and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Cordelia. It's inspiring to hear about your work as a woman of color in the construction trades and the only woman representing the local Union 26 office. I'm now pleased to welcome our last speaker, Dr. Hashima Hassan. Dr. Hassan is the NASA program scientist for New Star, the Keck Observatory at ADCAR, and is deputy program scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. She serves as the education and communication lead for astrophysics and as Executive Secretary of the Astrophysics Advisory Committee. In her role as program scientist, she makes sure that each project's mission remains possible and true to NASA strategic objectives. She's been honored with prestigious awards and fellowships throughout her outstanding career, including NASA Headquarters Exceptional Performance Award in 2008. Dr. Hassan. Thank you for that kind introduction, and I'd like to thank the uh, Women's Congressional Policy Institute and the Bipartisan Women's Caucus for giving me this opportunity for this very exciting uh, discussion. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today as the Deputy Program Scientist of the James Webb Space Telescope. Webb is a technological wonder which will enable humankind to unlock mysteries of the formation of the early universe. As I see the promise of groundbreaking science in the spectacular images and spectra from Webb, I feel a sense of pride and achievement that I played a leading role in enabling scientific teams circumvent challenges to put up the instrumentation they needed to deliver the science and those incredible images of our universe. I look back at the day I landed on the shores of USA as a young bride with $25 in my pocket, my wits, and a doctorate in theoretical nuclear physics from the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. I gave this nation all I had, and it paid me back in spades. I consider myself blessed that I have worked on some of the most challenging and exciting research projects in academia and the federal government. My meandering path to NASA started as a research scientist at Duke University and the US EPA amongst the tobacco fields and forests of North Carolina. A short hiatus back to my native India, followed by Space Telescope Science Institute, Baltimore, where I wrote the optical simulation software for the soon to be launched Hubble Space Telescope and its science instruments before joining NASA headquarters as a visiting senior scientist and then as a civil servant. While I was overjoyed at achieving what seemed like an impossible dream of working at NASA, I was somewhat intimidated whenever I sat in a meeting room and saw that I was the only one of color and often the only woman, though that is slowly changing. I had been the only woman scientist of color in previous academic positions, though not always the only woman. I have found that colleagues and supervisors respect the work of women of color, but are hesitant to give them full credit. 
When I express my opinion at a meeting, it is often either ignored, credited to someone else, or sometimes ridiculed when a white male states something to the contrary, even though his statement is later proved to be wrong. This culture is so systemic that there is a danger of it subconsciously penetrating new leaders. Along the way, I raised two sons. Maternity leave and childcare were a struggle. Paid maternity leave is critical for the health of the mother to recover from childbirth and lactation so she can return to, to work with full energy. Ideally, it should be six months, as is the rule with many progressive governments. A flexible work schedule and an effort by the employer to be accommodating is one way to retain employees and make them felt included and valued. It is particularly important for women of color who are first generation immigrants and do not have the family and community support that their white counterparts have. I have had many achievements I am proud of, but the one that propelled me to prominence as a role model to students and young professionals through a news report in the Times of India after the launch of JWST is my current position at NASA. LinkedIn requests and speaking requests from students, schools, professional as well as private organizations have gone up exponentially, though they have been primarily from people of color. I have come a long way from the time I stared at the clear dark skies in my hometown, Lucknow, India. A girl child born in a minority Muslim community soon after India became an independent nation who dreamed of reaching the stars. I have been fortunate to achieve my dream. The sheer excitement of working at NASA has enabled me to overlook the shortcomings introduced by my color and gender. However, these shortcomings must be fixed to fully harness the talents of our women of color and attract and keep them in STEM careers. On the one hand, I have had opportunities in academia to lead research and as program scientist on several NASA missions, including the Hubble Space Telescope and SOFIA. On the other hand, I see myself like many women of color hitting not only the glass ceiling, but also the bamboo ceiling faced by Asian Americans, both women and men. I cannot stress the importance of having women of color in senior leadership positions, not only so they can fully utilize their talents, but also to be a role model to younger women to stay in STEM careers. There are cases where women of color have re received senior executive service certification from OPM, but languished in the general schedule for almost 20 years with no accountability to the senior leadership of their organization. A lack of recognition of outstanding work by women of color is not only demoralizing to these women, but for younger women and men of color who get discouraged and leave the STEM workforce. While white women have made great strides in recent years in gaining recognition and senior leadership positions, their counterparts of color have been left behind. They have to prove they are better than the best to be even seriously considered for a job or recognition. In closing, the primary takeaway I hope you will consider is to attract, is that to attract and retain women of color in STEM, leadership at, at STEM related companies unions and organizations should be culturally sensitive and inclusive, give women of color meaningful recognition of their skills and achievements, offer them career advancement paths, and be held accountable 
for failing to promote outstanding women of color to senior leadership positions. The senior leadership must start looking like the diverse face of USA. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much, Hashima, for those very insightful remarks. Um, now I am going to introduce uh, Congressman Chrissy Houlihan. Uh, Congressman Houlihan is serving her second term representing the 6th District of Pennsylvania. She serves on the Small Business, Foreign Affairs, and Armed Services Committees. Congressman Houlihan is co-chair of the Congressional Women in STEM Caucus and has worked to introduce legislation to improve STEM education and help modernize the teaching of STEM courses. Congressman Houlihan. Thank you. It's very nice to be amongst my people uh, here in Washington. There's not a lot of women. Uh, there's definitely not a lot of STEM professionals. Uh, in fact, there's about 20% of our body are women, uh, and about less than two dozen of the 435 members of Congress have a STEM background at all. So it's um, very, very awesome to be amongst people who are focusing on all of the things I prize the most women in STEM and STEAM, communities of color in STEM and STEAM, uh, and making sure that there's equity uh, and progress in our world. Uh, so thank you very much to the Women's Congressional Policy Institute for uh, allowing me to join you guys and to make some uh, remarks, opening remarks, or about the important role of women of color in STEM careers. Uh, some of you may know before joining Congress, I was an engineer, uh, an entrepreneur, and I served in the United States Air Force as an engineer. Throughout my career across all of these fields, one theme was constant, and we've heard that from your, you as well this morning, Doctor. Very few women, and even fewer women of color, have ever stood alongside me. In fact, I was one of only 10 women in my engineering major at Stanford. Unfortunately, the picture in engineering and many other STEM fields is very similar today. In fact, my youngest child graduated five years ago from Stanford in a different program than I participated in, but the same program 30 years later, still has only 10% women. Women make up only half of, about half of the population, 51% to be exact, but we only hold 16% of the engineering jobs. 28% of Americans are from underrepresented minority groups, but only 11% of those have jobs in the physical sciences. For these reasons, increasing the participation of women and girls in STEM and STEAM fields is seriously personal to me, and it's been one of my highest priorities since I've been elected to Congress uh, about three or four years ago at this point in time. In fact, it is what led me to start the Women in STEM Caucus alongside my colleagues, Representative Stevens, who I'm not sure if you've heard from yet, not yet, uh, Representative Lesko, and unfortunately the late Congresswoman Wolarski. Two Democrats, two Republicans, all women who started this Women in STEM Caucus. Uh, remarkable the fact that just a couple years ago there was no such organization or body in the Congress, and that's also um, a testament to this problem. Congresswoman Wolarski was deeply committed to strengthening our nation's workforce and to the encouragement of girls of all ages to explore STEM fields. She was a great partner in this endeavor, and I know she is and will be missed deeply by many of us. With her in mind, we must all do our part to make sure that we're moving the needle forward and spreading awareness of the importance of diversity in STEM, both here in Congress, but also outside with the public as well. I'm proud to say that I had a bill that recently passed the House called the Mathematical and Statistical Modeling Education Act. It passed the House bipartisanly with, with her just a few months ago. And importantly, on that particular piece of legislation, it talks about the importance of mathematical and statistical modeling in K through 12. This is something you know in our curriculums that are not is not necessarily addressed, and a lot of our young people, girls uh, particularly, can't quite understand what is this for? Why am I learning this? This math, this science stuff. Mathematical and statistical modeling is one of the ways that we can innovate our curricula to make sure that people understand what it's for. Education, as, I, as we're talking about right now, is a super powerful tool through which we can inspire and instill the next generation of girls and, and communities of color with the science and math skills they need to succeed. I'm a former teacher as well. I used to teach high school chemistry in North Philadelphia. All of my children were black, and I am clearly not. 
Uh, that is one of the bigger problems that we also have is making sure that our pipeline of educators looks like the children that they're teaching so that when I'm standing in front of a classroom and teaching my kids about the power of chemistry and the power of science and math, it would be really lovely if I would actually look like them. Um, so that's something we also have legislation to address. With the signing of the most recent piece of legislation that I'm sure you guys are aware of called the CHIPS Act, is con there is a conversation in, included in, a co in that bill, a conversation about women and women of color in STEM, and it's more urgent than ever. Recently up in my community, which is just outside of Philadelphia, I had the chance to go to Albright University in the city of Reading. For those of you guys who ever played Monopoly, the city of Reading is where the Reading Railroad is. It's a city in my district that is nearly 70% Hispanic. So I had the opportunity to visit their Science Research Institute, which our office was able to support through something called community funding, uh, community project funding. There I was able to speak with many of the young women who were studying food science and how it relates to allergies or biomedical studies and the progress of cancer research. And yes, even some of them were doing drones and drone manufacturing. The drone part was my favorite part. Um, there was a young girl there, uh, nine years old, and I think that I, I speculate that she was uh, somewhere on the spectrum, but this young girl could just fly a drone like nobody else, and she could literally make it do flips over your shoulder and around your head, uh, and it was just so remarkable and inspiring that she was inspired to, to find her passion in this way. This is another example that when we invest in diverse communities of all kinds, we make real progress towards creating a more inclusive STEM and STEAM workforce, and the emphasis is also on STEAM as well. Uh, ironically, when I was here trying to found the Women in STEM Caucus, I really wanted it to be the Women in STEM and STEAM Caucus, but people didn't know what STEAM was. Uh, and so that's another indicator of what's going on here in the halls of Congress. With historical investments from Congress in new jobs and new industries and new opportunities, we hope that more opportunities and more jobs will be available to women and to girls and communities of color. It's through events like these that we can stimulate creative thinking on ways that we can improve participation in the STEM fields by women and women of color for so many years to come. I really look forward to engaging in exciting conversation today and ongoing to our continued commitment, you can guarantee from Haley and others of us here, to find ways to build a more inclusive and advanced uh, tomorrow in STEM. I thank you again for the opportunity to speak uh, for uh, on behalf of the Congress, and I welcome uh, the chance to, to learn with you and grow with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Congresswoman Houlihan, for your remarks. We appreciate your support for women of color in STEM. And now I'm next pleased to welcome Congresswoman Haley Stevens. Congresswoman Stevens is serving her second term, representing the 11th District of Michigan. She serves on the Education and Labor and Science, Space and Technology Committees. Congresswoman Stevens is co-chair of the Congressional Women in STEM Caucus and has worked to introduce legislation to strengthen STEM education for young learners and address the gender gap in STEM fields. Congresswoman Stevens. Thank you. Well, Cynthia, I have to say it's, it's such an honor to, to be with you and our distinguished panel um, of, of, of witnesses, I guess, of, of, of testifiers, you know, from IBEW to Qualcomm, our friends, at, you know, at NASA, as well as the vice chair of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Uh, you know, we are, we are dedicated to your portfolios of work. And even though votes were just called, I said, listen, I have a very important engagement, and I want all of you to understand this, because this can be focused on the STEM gap, building pathways for women of color in STEM careers is one of the imperatives of our time. It is part of my motivation here in this body uh, my legislative motivation, my policy motivation, my constituent motivation. I come from a district very rich in the STEM, STEAM fields, right? Uh, I'm from the Motor City. I represent the largest concentration of automotive suppliers in the country. Uh, I mentioned I'm the vice chair of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. I'm also the chair of the Research and Technology Subcommittee. And last year, uh, led the Congress, led the committee in the Congress through uh, the NSF for the Future Act. And, and, and part of how we pass a bill, right, is we, we go through a process of 
introducing the bill, of having uh, fact-finding hearings surrounding the legislation, marking up the bill, passing it through committee, and then bringing it to the House floor. And as we were engaged in that process, and this was a very rigorous undertaking, we spoke to researchers across the country, across the country, uh, engaging them in how we're going to double our scientific research budget, and also begin to seriously, in a more meaningful way, invest in the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece as a nation. We certainly at, at NSF have had the investments. We've heard from NASA. We can have NASA testify, and I've asked that question to NASA many, many times over in terms of how they are, in particular, focus on women of color in their agency. And what we found as we were going through the NSF for the Future uh, bill process, researcher after researcher said, we are leaving behind American talent. We are leaving behind our own talent, geographically and demographically. And it's not acceptable because we are cut to the bone in terms of the availability of workforce. And I. I certainly deeply appreciate that we are here in a bipartisan way, right? Because when you say the things, I am interested in workforce, I am interested in women in STEM, I am interested in growing the women in STEM professions, right, by including women of color in a more pronounced way, you start to take a look at the pathways. You take a look at the pathways. And and Julia here, who's my one my lead science staff, who also hails from Michigan, we were we were discussing this earlier. We've got 2.5% of professors in the STEM fields who are black women. Think about that. It it doesn't work. It doesn't work when you cannot be what when you, you can't be what you can't see. And when we're not reaching out and we're not thinking about doing it differently, and we're going to say the words, we're going to be here right now and say that we are prioritizing the pathways for women of color. But until we look at the intersectionality of the issue, right, and the pandemic has been a wake up for that, uh, looking at daycare, looking at paid leave, looking at flexible hours, looking at pay equity, Right, pay equity, fair pay, equal pay. Give you know our president talks about this. We're not going to get there. We're not going to get there. Now, I love Black Girls Who Code. You know, I've been an evangelizer of the program. We've got Girls Who Code in in the district, which has been which has been terrific. We've got the largest number of first robotics teams in the country coming from my state in in, in Michigan, and then we've got the girls teams. And there are also diverse girls teams. And so my commitment to them as a member of Congress is KIT, keep in touch. Because I want to know, I, I, can, I can only begin to solve these problems if I know your lived experience. You know, I got IBEW on speed dial in Michigan, all right? And, and that's truly because of the apprenticeship program and the narratives that come out of it. And it was really smart to include them here today, partly because they're on the tipping point of, of this whole energy transformation that's taking place with electric vehicles, which is why the president was introduced by the IBEW last week at his uh, ceremonial signing of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, you know, we, we, we're here today talking about the statistics. We, we can talk about the statistics, we can recognize the statistics, we need to bring those to light. But we also need to focus on the how and how it gets addressed. Yes, we need the dollars to meet the needs, and I can go through this very quickly because it's of, of its importance. It wasn't just in the NSF for the Future Act. We have, with the Chips and Science Act, the investment in a couple of different fields that are a couple of different categories that I think are going to be important to us. I passed the Building Blocks of STEM Act that was done last term in the Congress, requiring the NSF to make the early childhood investments on a continual basis with a priority on girls and girls in STEM. So look that one up, the Building Blocks of STEM Act. And for all of you who are going back to your respective destinations, see if you're getting those NSF dollars, right? See if you even have that on your radar, if you're applying, and then call me, because I want to help champion the accessibility of those dollars and the implementation of those dollars that signed and passed 
uh, le legislation that is that is deeply, deeply important. Also with, included in the CHIPS and Science Act, signed into law, CHIPS and Science, really that, that now includes the NSF in the future. So this is a huge milestone for us. The STEM Opportunities Act was included in there, which empowers federal agencies and universities to identify and lower barriers to the recruitment, retention, and advancement of women, minorities, and other groups underrepresented in STEM studies and, and careers. Taking this a layer deeper, the chair of the science committee is Congresswoman, outgoing Congresswoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson, all right? The, the first person of color to be elected to the Congress from the state of Texas, a 30-year career, absolutely phenomenal. So where else do we need to push within our HBCUs? This is another thing that our committee has uncovered that our HBCUs have not been receiving equitable science dollars. So as a follow-up to today's engagement, we'd really love to work with you on that, to tie in, obviously, HBCUs and women, right? And, and this is, we do the research applications, we do the engineering applications, we do the, the you know, hard-nosed manufacturing applications, which are so, so important as well. But we need to, we need to match it on equity. And our HBCUs, are under attack, right? You know, we're a little fed up with some of these assaults on HBCUs and, 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 and domestic terrorism in the 21st century. So the Congresswoman for the Research and Tech Subcommittee wants to make sure we're matching those research dollars. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do, but it's only matched by partnership and a little bit of enthusiasm. So I couldn't be more excited to be with all of you. I'm so proud of, of you for taking time to come to the nation's capital today. I'm very grateful to our, our bipartisan convener and made the commitment and the work go forward and allow us to come back here a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, and start seeing the numbers reach parity. That 2.5% of professors being black women, if we can double, triple, quadruple that, over the next decade, that's where we need to go. And that's where some of our legislation passed, signed into law, is gonna start to make a world of difference, plus the legislation to come. So thank you all, thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Congresswoman Stevens, for those remarks and for your commitment to women of color and STEM and for prioritizing this discussion in the middle of votes. <laughs> and now we will now um, move to questions and discussion. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and use the mic provided by our staff. And if you can state your name and office before asking your question, that would be great. So if no one has a, their first question, I will um, go kick us off and I want to ask our speakers today, what was your proudest achievement in your career so far and do you feel your success had an impact on how other women of color on your team were seen or even in your field? And you can use the mics provided at the table to answer the question, please. I can go first. Um, so I, I would say, um, I don't know if I have proudest moments. Uh, I've had many along the way and definitely my technical achievements are one but um, also I'm most excited when I share my story and I feel like it inspires like other women I, I did have an opportunity to go back to my alma mater uh, Stanford to talk to graduate students in the electrical engineering and, and CS department and most of the women where where I was uh, almost uh, 15 years ago where they're thinking can I make it is my thesis going to be done Am I doing anything worthwhile? This is so hard. This is uh, impossible. And the ability to actually be to encourage them and say, you know what, I was thinking the same thing 15 years ago. Today, I'm where I am, and I'm excited that I made it through. I'm excited that I persevered. I'm excited that I even stayed at Stanford and learned all the tools that I have now to make a difference and, and have my inventions or even walk in the STEM field. So I was able to encourage them. And I left there energized knowing that, you know what, uh, my pain or what I thought was impossible then is now possible and I can pass that on and I encourage, and they felt encouraged and, and to even take the next step. Those moments for me, I think are really um, just just fulfilling. It makes it worthwhile to do what I do, and even much more than my technical achievements. Those, 
actually make a difference because you really feel like you are making a difference in somebody's life and inspiring them to be their very best. Um, for me, um, I have several proud moments, but um, my one of my moments as far as now being a business rep for IBW number twenty six is I am able to give back. Um, to, to the job site, I said we call that the back to the simple fact that now I or, uh, mentioned earlier as far as being part of the DC Diva, um, I attended a women's coalition uh, um, event, um, I think it was in April, and me befriending the owner, and I was able to bring him into Local 26, and we um, had have a partnership now with the DC Divas, and that's how I'm able to bring more women into the trade. Upon doing that, using my platform, whenever I travel or, or attend different job sites or whatnot, contact the uh, superintendent to walk a few job sites and I see maybe a female that's out there maybe doing a labor or whatever, I'm able to com communicate to her more because now I have freedom to use my platform and encourage her, it's like, here, this is my business card, whatever the case might be, have you ever thought about being an agent? And it, I'm not an agent, an attrition, and it helps because now she can see a female that's right in front of her that actually did that task and now she's a business agent or whatever so i use my platform not only for myself but to accept, um to actually give back to other women that's planning to become electricians also to show them that we can also become electricians but actually elevate to become more than you know being an electrician so i i am proud of as far as being an uh, electrician and elevate into a different manager position where i'm able to contact and speak to other women on the platform now currently um as a business rep from um, through 26. So uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, I after the launch of uh, JWST, that's when I really started getting a lot of requests and and kids and uh, women saying that we feel really inspired. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, as some of my colleagues have said, when, when they see someone like them, then they feel maybe I can do it too. And in fact, when, when I went to Oxford, that was something behind what, what happened is when I was sitting at, at the dining table one day and uh, talking to one, one of my friends and I asked her where her sister was who had been in. Uh, in my class in Lucknow, and she said, oh, she's in Oxford. And I thought, she's in Oxford? She wasn't as good a student as I was. Maybe I can try going to Oxford too. And so I wrote to Oxford, and, and that's how I got there. So, um, uh, so I think it is really important to go out and talk to uh, the kids, and, and, um, and, and, and I'm doing that more and more now. Thank you. Do we have any um, questions from attendees? Okay. Um, I'll ask the speakers our second question. Um, so diversity can encompass many different things, and having grown up in Nigeria, Guyana, and Buffalo, New York, and also India, can you, and bringing that perspective into your successful careers, what do you wish more hiring managers and other leadership would consider when hiring? that stood out to me when I came to America, um, or even actually entering into the corporate world, was um, the communication style that I grew up with, um, um, my background. It, it, it's um, a bit passionate. Um, we, we talk very fast. Um, we um, sometimes interrupt each other because everybody just wants to get their idea down. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so in going into, into the corporate world, that was a, a challenge that I had at the beginning because I would communicate that way and a lot of people would you know, not, it wasn't the most effective way to communicate. But um, one thing I was glad is, is the fact that Qualcomm did not um, roll me out, right? They saw like I had something to contribute and how I came as I am. And, and with time, I refined how, how I communicate. Uh, so I think hiring managers need to be more cognizant of maybe the cultural backgrounds of people coming into their organizations, into their companies and saying, does this person have the potential, for example, to invent? 
even though they're not communicating the way that we would like, you know, how can we train them to help them do it? Do they have the potential to invent? Even though they're not inventing right now, or may not even have thought about inventing, how can we help them do that? So I think hiring managers just need to be more, uh, sometimes more tolerant and understand, you know, sort of educate themselves too about the cultural backgrounds of the different people that are coming into your organization so that you can best tailor training and your resources to them to help them really be their best in whatever they are. They, they are going to. So that's, you know, I think one area in which I at least struggled with and then over time um, got to really be more um, I know for myself, as I stated earlier, I use my platform, my platform to um, test the starter. So what I do currently is if I, um, for instance, we walk a job site and I see you don't have enough uh, women as far as a foreman or general foreman, I would contact the, the um, the superintendent for that contractor and I would give my um, um, input as far as look I walk this job site there's over 400 um, men on the job site and there's no women there I see women workers and I have one or two but we need more women to be in manager position you know and in doing so I will follow up and there's like look you have a position available and what that can you start that women at least have her run like two or three men under her and then from there on branch off and I see the heat to that um, there's times when I would, besides the job site, um, for myself in the, at the hall for us to have more women in the, in the, um, the site, we have this thing called Sisters of 26, in which now we implement in the Boys and Girls School. Um, we're starting from the kids from like um, the fifth and sixth graders. We're going out to the clubs or the elementary school um, doing job fairs. And so the kids can see, like the young ladies can see, oh, women are electricians. You know, I'm women in, in manager positions like, oh, wow, well, if they can do it, I can do it, like she said earlier. And that, to me, that's fulfilling. And not only do I use my platform on that, I look at other women be behind me. That's later on when I retire, there's other women that have to fill that position. I'm looking at the amount of percentage of women years from now that we want to increase. This is 2022. So far in Local 26, we only have about 300 women. Out of three, 300 women, we barely have like maybe 50 women in the local. Currently, I interview over a thousand men. I mean, a thousand applicants for the uh, apprenticeship. Out of a twenty, a thousand men, I had maybe five women that applied for the apprenticeship, um, and I had like three women, three African American women that applied. So we're not out there in elementary or high school or whatnot for them to know. Like, look, we're available there. It's not, a, it's a male dominated trade, but it's also opening to women. And we can get in there. So my thing is penetrating for the elementary school, the high school and colleges, because college is not for everyone. And to show them what it's all about or whatever, and just to see another face, it helps out a lot. So I use my platform to try to penetrate to different um, contractors and whatnot. I can give my input and my business manager he listens to me. And that helps out a lot for us to work our relationship regards to assist the women that's coming in. And he wants that as well to increase the amount, the amount of women that's coming into Local 26 and having childcare available for them for us to retain the women because we don't have that currently, but we're working on that. I think some people have said it in a slightly different way, but the same thing is that uh, I think it's important for for uh, uh, employers not to subconsciously profile the candidates. Mm -hmm. So when you see, oh, this is a young woman, she'll probably take leave because she's going to have kids. Or, or she's from India, her accent is different. Mm -hmm. or, or, the, or in fact, I even had someone tell me, that you have a PhD from a foreign country. <laughs> and, you know, so it, it's really important not to profile those people, but to look at their talents. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's especially for women, that, that's really important because uh, they have other responsibilities as well. And uh, so hi hiring uh, you know, officials should, should be conscious of that. Thank you so much. I think this will be our last question. So in one minute or less, what are one or two primary takeaways you hope the policymakers who've attended would consider in their work? Um, I think one of the things we've talked about a lot today is creating this inclusion.
inclusive environment. And really, uh, that I think is one of the biggest things that we, we can do to really encourage either women to recruit them in, to retain them, to even become models for, for the younger ones coming. It's really creating an environment where everybody feels comfortable enough to be able to be themselves and bring their best self, self to work. So for me, that would be uh, what I would employ the policymakers, whatever we can do to make sure that people are feeling comfortable with being who they are, learning more, exposing them to new things, new experiences. Um, yes, let's do that, but let's make them comfortable. Let's let them know that they, they are valued, they're cherished, they matter, their contributions matter, like recognize them often when they're doing the things that have worked well. And I also want to also stress the ability to not also let this whole inclusive environment job rest on the shoulders of the underrepresented people. They should not be only the only champions. We need to form allies. We need people who are not underrepresented to be out there helping us spread the message of inclusion and diversity. We need everybody working together to create this environment. I think that is key and crucial. Um, as I stated earlier, as far as working with various teams and whatnot, um, that's a beautiful thing. However, in order for us to retain them, we still need to open the channel as far as having child care for women. It's hard. Um, our work hours are between 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, there's no child care that's open around that time in the morning. So I know once I got into the office, that was my first thing. We have buildings. We can open child care for them. If we don't have child care available for them, we can have vouchers for them. Not only do we have that, there's something that we can negotiate that into our contract in which we can have contractors work with us or have some kind of stipend for them in order for us to do so. Um, in doing so, speaking to my business manager, that's something that we're going to do next. Um, for the next three, our contract is every three years. So we have um, two more years, for uh, one more year for us to. Um, for that to terminate and then we have a new contract so so that's something that we're going to implement currently we have pto available um and which back in the days we never had that you know in which male or female you have a um, whatever emergency when it comes to taking your kids for daycare or whatever doctor's appointment it wouldn't be held against you because of the kids because you have bank up hours in which you can take four hours increment and take them to the doctors, whatever, and then later on return to work or actually go to your appointment and then later on return to work. So that has helped a lot, but that's still not enough. We still need childcare because a lot of times women are the breadwinner, breadwinner, breadwinner of the family. And it's like, okay, if you have to work, who's gonna take care of the child? Who's gonna take them to school? You know, so we need that implemented. And that was something that I brought up to my business manager. And that's the beautiful thing about it. That's something that we're working on. And I am doing my research as far as different local, how they're implementing that into their CBA and try to do that the same to our CBA as well. So that's what I'm tasked with since I opened my mouth and stated we needed that. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so standing on the theme of, of uh, inclusion, uh, I think this has to go, uh, as I also mentioned earlier, has to go right to the top. The senior leadership has to start looking like the face of America. We have to have women of color in senior leadership. They're, they are being hired, but they are not being placed in, in senior leadership. I think that is the number one message I would uh, uh, say. And the second message would be uh, building on her theme uh, that uh, 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 maternity leave, child care leave, family care leave, because for those are the tasks where women are single out most, and so if you, and women of color tend to have, you know, more than uh, re responsibilities in that area for whatever. Indy will uh, give, be giving some closing remarks at this time. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you to each of our speakers for your inspiring presentations. You've given us so much to think about, so many great suggestions, and a lot of common themes and threads throughout what everyone had to say. Um, there clearly is significant interest in the continuing gap for women of color in STEM, STEAM. 
um, and we hope that our speakers' insights and personal experiences will contribute to successful bipartisan solutions to many of these challenges. And this conversation was recorded. It should be available for viewing on our website at wcpinst.org tomorrow morning. And a short survey about today's discussion is at each seat or out in front, actually, out at the table, registration table. We hope that each of you will take a moment to respond. And we encourage anyone attending remotely to please fill out the online survey uh, that will be sent right after the briefing. Our thanks again to the Bipartisan Women's Caucus leadership, both members and staff, and thanks to Qualcomm for their support for this briefing. And finally, thanks to our moderator, Cynthia Ramos, Policy Director, Cheryl Williams, our Vice President, Kritika Sharma, our Communications Associate, whose last full day is today on our team, um, Valerie Franco, our intern, Bianca Pukshiva, and also Alsha Amiro and um, Afnan Adam, who I think has stepped out for their work to make this briefing possible. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.